you say Yukon to almost anyone, the first thing they think of is the gold rush, when about 30,000 men climbed the Chilkoot Pass and made their way down river to the Klondike. Or they think of the verses of Robert Service. There's a land where the mountains are nameless and the rivers all run God knows where. There are lives that are erring and aimless and deaths that just hang by a hair. But the gold rush was just a flash in the pan. The Yukon is a river in the northwest corner of North America. It rises in the mountains just 15 miles from the Pacific Ocean and runs nearly 2,000 miles to the Bering Sea. Before the turn of the century, it provided the only practical access to a part of the country that was cut off from the outside by rugged mountains on three sides. Riverboats came up from the Bering Sea occasionally as far as Selkirk, and beyond that, you were on your own. Even before the gold rush, some traders and prospectors had come in over the Chilkoot and White Passes, and in 1898, the White Pass and Yukon Route Company began building a railway from Skagway over the mountains and around the rapids to Whitehorse. Here's how Skagway looked in the 30s. The trains chugged down the main street and started to climb. Building the road was a superhuman effort, one of the engineers wrote. The strong winds and severe cold made the men torpid and benumbed not only their minds, but their bodies, so that after one hour's work, it was necessary to relieve them by fresh men. Nonetheless, only 35 men were lost from illness or accident out of 3,500 who were employed. Once, when a gold strike was rumored, 65% of the laborers abandoned the job and stampeded. But the line was eventually finished in 1900. Whitehorse became the railhead because it was the head of navigable waters. The trouble was, for seven months of the year, the boats were frozen in. The railway company ran an overland stage to Dawson. The route was over 400 miles, with a way station every 20 miles where you could get a hot meal or a bunk for $2. The trip from Whitehorse to Dawson took from four to 10 days, one way, depending on the condition of the trail. In summer, the river route took only a day and a half downstream or four and a half days upstream. It was 460 miles past Lake Labarge, Hootalinqua, Carmax, the Five Fingers, Rink, and Hell's Gate Rapids, and numberless bends and shallows. Two months before breakup, a bull gang would arrive to get ready for launching. The first job was to chip out ice lodged under the hulls. The creeks and rivers broke up first, but the ice held on the lakes. To speed the breakup on Lake Labarge, they used to lay down lamp black mixed with old crankcase oil to absorb the sun's heat and melt the ice. Downstream at Dawson, the whole town would bet on the day and hour the ice would go out. These shots were taken in 1932, the year the Dawson dock was carried away. Up at Whitehorse and Carcross, shipwrights and crews repaired any damage that had been done the year before. The boats were jacked up and the cribbing was removed. They put tallow and grease on the ways. Then they put the butterboards in place to support the steamer as it slid down. They tried fish oil, but the dogs ate it all off. It took three or four weeks to launch all the boats, with one going down the ways every two or three days. The boats
Boats were designed to take a lot of freight in shallow water. Flat bottom, no keel, shallow draft, with a prow shaped not to cut into the water, but to channel it under the hull where it was needed. The wheelhouse was well forward to get a good look at the river ahead. The first boats carried liquor and food for Dawson. Bills of lading for other cargo read like a mail order catalog. And there was enough wood to fire up and reach the first wood pile downstream. The paddle wheel was set in the stern to avoid damage because the river was fast and the channels were sometimes very narrow. Usually by late May, Lake LaBarge was open and traffic got into full swing. Often they pushed a barge so they could carry more freight. One of the spring hazards was migrating caribou. Sometimes the steamers had to come to a full stop to let them clear the river. Five fingers, an old timer called it, five huge rocks like sentries in midstream. First time down in spring, they'd likely put out a boat and take a look. The government did a lot of blasting on the cliffs to make the passage safer. You had to be ready to cut straight across the river as soon as you were through, or you'd hit a submerged rock. This brought the stern very close to the cliff, and more than one boat had her upper housework damaged. Every 50 miles or so, there'd be a wood pile, depending on the amount of wood needed for certain stretches of the river, and also, of course, on a safe depth of water and a convenient bank height. It was the deckhand's job to get the wood on board. The number of cords ordered by the ship's master were measured off by the purser. Each cartload was about a third of a cord, and it took about a cord an hour to keep the paddle turning at roughly 22 revolutions per minute, which was about right so that you'd be pushing water and not air. The river boats were the lifeline in summer, with stops all along the shore. The mates got the cargo sorted out, and the purser kept the paperwork straight. Sometimes there'd be an Indian trapper moving his dogs and gear down the river. Or an old timer who'd been outside and would come home. There are hardships that nobody reckons. There are valleys unpeopled and still. There's a land, and it beckons and beckons. And I want to go back, and I will. A sharp bend with fast water could cause you trouble. If you were pushing a barge, you had to jackknife it around by tightening the lines on one side and slackening off on the other. Sandbars and channels were always shifting with the current. Bill Bromley, the master of the Klondike, said, after years of experience in this kind of work, you get so that you can read the water. Different whirlpools indicate different depths of water. That's what we're continuously on the lookout for. You've got to be on your own when you're on these rivers. 36 hours after leaving Whitehorse, Dawson City. The boats put up here for 24 hours while they blew down the boilers and cleaned them. The crew got some rest. They got mighty little sleep on the way down. 
There was lots doing in Dawson in the 30s. It was a prosperous place, maybe 2,000 people. East of the city, they were still mining gold. One of the biggest dredges in the world was working on the creeks at that time. At the Yukon Consolidated Gold Room at Bear Creek, they melted down the dust and nuggets. It's interesting that of $250 million taken out of the creeks, three quarters of it was after 1900. Those 30,000 sourdoughs didn't find it all. But it didn't take much space on the steamers to carry the gold bricks out. So when they struck rich loads of silver and base metals in the Mayo District, it was a great thing for the White Pass and Yukon route. Several mines were opened, and there was pretty heavy investment in plant and equipment. Ore was hauled by cat train and stacked at Mayo Landing. The new mining area was on the Stewart River, southeast of Dawson. During the summer, the ore was moved downriver to Stewart Landing and transshipped to upgoing steamers. The Stewart River was even shallower than the Yukon, so in 1922, the smaller Kino was built to move the ore down to the junction of the two rivers. They tried to time their arrival at Stewart Landing to meet a steamer coming up from Dawson, so the 125-pound sacks would only have to be manhandled once. The ore was a payload for the upriver boats and barges that had been traveling practically empty. The only drawback was that pushing a barge added half again to the fuel cost. So in 1929, the Klondike was built to take more freight without a barge. She was 240 feet long overall. That's two-thirds the length of a football field. But some of the boats still needed the barges. Gasoline had become a big item along the river. A wood contractor might be moving his whole operation. And there was always the general cargo. Going upstream at Five Fingers, the steamers needed help. A one-inch steel cable about 1,500 feet long was permanently fixed to the shore at both ends, leaving enough slack to be wrapped around a steamer's winch. The first mate was in charge of the action on deck while the vessel was being lined up between the cliffs. The operation took about half an hour, and probably an extra cord of wood. Because of the changing shoals and channels, in shallow stretches, deckhands were constantly taking soundings, both port and starboard. But a gravel bar could come up fast. If they ran aground, the first thing they did was reverse the paddles to try and wash away the gravel under the hull. If that didn't work, they'd get a cable ashore and fasten it solidly to try and winch themselves off. Sometimes they had to put out as much as 10,000 feet of cable. If that failed, they had to use the spars that they carried lashed to the forward housing. Depending on whether they were trying to get off sideways or straight, they'd put one or both spars over the side through a metal collar. With winches and block and tackle, they'd actually hoist the hull off the bottom, then lurch forward three or four feet at a time, like a sick grasshopper. This operation could take up to 36 hours, and it used a lot of wood, so that no matter how tired the crew were, they'd have to wood up at the next wood pile. There was grounding, and there was grounding. That's the Casca in 1936. In the same year, the Klondike was holed, coming around a point near Hudalinkma and sank in a few feet of water. No lives were lost, and the superstructure and machinery were salvaged to be used in the construction of Klondike II. She had the same broad beam for freight and square knuckles to prevent sideslipping. slipping. 
In spring and fall, the ships would tie up at night if there was a bad stretch of water ahead. In summer, nights were short, never totally dark, so the captains often kept right on going. Though the Klondike didn't carry many passengers, the tourist trade up and down the river and in the lakes above Whitehorse was important to the economy. The masters loved the river. And when there was something to see, they'd blow the whistle. Sometimes a wood raft would float by. Or a local fisherman would be out with his fish wheel catching salmon and grayling. Crossing Lake Labarge, the passengers would be allowed in the wheelhouse. The steamer would make 10 to 14 trips in the five-month season. The last run usually took a full load of liquor down to Dawson and brought back a last load of ore and a bunch of miners going out for the winter. Most of the boats wintered at Whitehorse. They lined up, waiting to be hauled up the ways by steam winches. Freeze-up was about the middle of October. Up at Carcross, south of Whitehorse, they still used horse-drawn capstans to haul out the lake steamers. Hauling out was pretty much a reverse action of the launching. Of course, we've got airlines and highways with big 18-wheelers rolling in, winter and summer. But it'll never be like it was in the days of the riverboats. Mm -hmm. 